Hello, my name is Laura Novich, and welcome to my talk on Documentation Communities, Sound Strategy or Documentarian's Gambit. Today we're going to talk about SillyDB's journey from closed to open source documentation. The items we considered, what our solution included, where we are now, what we have planned for the future, and how you can help. So as I said before, my name is Laura Novich, and I'm a member of Write the Docs in Israel, and I help coordinate events that we hold here. I started in technical writing 24 years ago, and have been working in open source companies for the past seven. In addition to working at SillaDB, I teach at Our Best Words, where I instruct and mentor students to become involved in open source documentation. As part of my course, I piloted a project where my students helped GitLab improving their documentation quality. In my spare time, I love to bake, and last summer, during what would have been one of several lockdowns, I binged on The Queen's Gambit. The Queen's Gambit is a mini-series about a young protege who masters chess and is available for viewing on Netflix. I won't say anything more about it other than to say that if you haven't watched it, you should. When I thought about open source documentation, the first thing I did was to create a list of companies who have open source docs. If your company's name is not on this list and you have open source docs, feel free to put your company's name in the chat. GitLab was founded in 2011 and has always had open source docs. Today, there are 10 writers who work at GitLab together with over 100 community members who actively contribute to GitLab's documentation on a monthly basis. Microsoft. It may be surprising that the biggest proprietary software company in the world is open sourced, but they are. Most of Azure is open, as is the docs. Red Hat has always been and always will be a huge supporter of the open source community. All of their projects that are open have open source docs. Their enterprise level products are not. Docker was founded in 2010 and launched in 2011. Their docs have always been open. The surprising one was GitHub, who until October of 2020 had not opened their docs, but they did thankfully in October of 2020. So GitHub is finally open. In addition to looking at the big corporations mentioned here, I also look at companies that are within our competitive space and domain. A little bit about SillaDB. SillaDB was founded by Dora Laor and Avi Kaviti in 2014. They worked together at Kumernet, developing KVM, and were instrumental for Kumernet's purchase by Red Hat in 2008. When Avi and Dora began their new adventure in 2012, they created a company based on key values of transparency, accountability, collaboration, and playing fair. At the time, the company was called Cloudius, but in 2014, it was changed to SillaDB. Their quest began with creating for a drop-in replacement for Apache Cassandra, but today the product has matured to not only be a replacement for Cassandra, but for DynamoDB as well. Today, Scylla is the big time, big data database, an API compatible with Apache Cassandra and Amazon DynamoDB. It shares, it, sorry, Scylla embraces a shared nothing approach that increases throughput and storage capacity by as much as tenfold. For more information, please go to our website at SillaDB.com. And we are also hiring, and all the information can be found on our website as well. When I joined Scylla, I was told, Laura, your biggest challenge will be to get the developers to write the docs. So I looked at what we had when I first joined, and we had an open source product, which is now pretty mature. We had many repositories that had all of the project's code, and none of them had docs, because all of the documentation was stored in a single repository, and that repository was closed. So it meant the contributors could not come to docs from the community, it had to be from the developers. And we treated our developers at the time as if they were part of the community. We were lucky that we had management who felt that docs were pivotal to sales and product marketing. We also had trainers who constantly referred to the docs. 
customers and users who actively use the docs. In fact, they open, often opened support tickets, citing errors in the docs. We had an open source documentation tool chain, which developers like to use. And we also had a constant stream of new hires and development, which for us meant more potential writers. That sounds great, right? But we wanted more. We wanted to have total commitment from everyone, not just a few developers. We wanted to allow our customers to choose the version of Docs to match the version or branch of the product. We obviously wanted more contributors, not just to Docs, but to the code as well. We wanted our maintainers to create Doc releases and to have them release at the same time as the product. We wanted to automate in documentation releases and testing, just like code. And we wanted to have total control over everything in doc, revolving around Docs. But we were missing a few things too. We were missing governance. We lacked a style guide. We lacked guides for contribution and assistance for contributing, not just to Docs, but to the project as well. We quickly realized that Docs was not the single source of truth. And moving forward, it would need to be. Our structure needed changing because every project had their own way of organizing Docs. We wanted a total buy-in, and we were missing that, from the entire organization, including the C-suite executives, developers, solutions, and more. We didn't have a reward system for rewarding contributors for their work. And we also lacked a bird's eye view, no real way to manage content and prevent duplication. So the challenge was keeping up with the constant release schedule. And this was hard because we had four products, many drivers, which meant we had multiple releases going out at the same time. And amidst the quick cadence of releases, we also had to make sure that our documentation was quality docs and that it was provided as early as possible, even before the release went out. Fixing issues was important too, and these were reported to us via the support team. Issues would be reported in Salesforce, which unfortunately, not everybody had the ability to look at. So all of the support tickets were sent by email to the people who had to be responsible to fix them. The support teams were writing knowledge base articles and other documents and sending these to customers by email without including the docs team. So for me, it felt really like the poor little mole in the whack-a-mole game, trying to keep my head above water and preventing myself from getting whacked in the head at the same time. So the first thing we did is to redesign our web page. And it looked really nice, but we didn't change the internals and didn't create any policies. So this meant that every issue that was open could create passionate discussions. Some of them resulted in changes to software, which is a good thing but it also meant that many issues would stay open for a very long time. There were a lot of suggestions on how to fix the docs, but not many contributors that were willing to fix them or provide fixable contributions. And on the other hand, it worked, or, or did it? In some cases, yes, because there were no real complaints. In fact, most customers said, we love the docs, which made me wonder, is it just me? Because to me, I felt like Hercules battling the Hydra, and this clearly had to change. So back to the drawing board we went for a more sustaining solution. Which brings me to the word gambit. A gambit is a chess opening move where the player, usually white, sacrifices a piece with the aim of achieving a subsequent potential advantage. If this move is considered by black to be something worthwhile, the strategy is considered sound. In looking at what we wanted, we were worried that all of this work would be derailed if we had any of the following. Apathy. What if nobody wanted to help us out? What if we got no contributors? What if the community wasn't engaged and brought into the process? What if none of the leaders of the company got on board? What if developers refused to write docs? What if the community didn't get on board and their contributions were poor? Or if the quality of the docs was poor, we couldn't sacrifice that because we already had proven to our customers and our users that our documentation quality was very good. And above all, what if everything 
that we planned from here to becoming open was an actual waste of time. So the first thing that we did to combat these gambits was to create a list of things that we thought we could action immediately. And some of these are, are takeaways that you can use on your organization as well. So to combat the gambits, you need to create a useful, meaningful, predictable structure within your repository and treat docs like a franchise. This means in all projects and all repositories, all across the organization, everything looks relatively similar and familiar to your users and to your contributors. You need to make it super duper easy to contribute. You need to provide self-service checks before you check in your work. It's important as a maintainer or as a reviewer to be kind when you review. You need to get everyone on board, especially management, and you need to constantly reward your contributors for every contribution they make, no matter how small. When looking at docs like a franchise, you need to make sure that every docs directory, in our case, has a similar hierarchy and structure. This allows you to be aware of content reuse. Every document type should have a template and your CSS or um, style guide should rule them all. Make it easy to contribute. Consider your entry point from the docs page. How are you getting your contributors to get involved? Start with a simple UI change, adding a button, which allows community members to add content easily. Some ways to do this are on the right-hand side of the slide. Not every company has the same icons for contributing, so make sure your contributors know what to do. There are several ways to do this. You should make sure every repository has a README, and inside every README, there should be a section that says how to contribute to the docs. It's also helpful if code is annotated. This doesn't just help your technical writers or your communicators, it helps your developers as well. Treat Git tags in GitHub just like developers do for code. Create a tag for documentation, for easy fix, or for help wanted. Create a Slack channel just for docs. We did this at Scylla, not only within our corporate Slack channel, but also in our users Slack channel as well. Participate in writing days at Write the Docs conferences. This allows you to make friends, get suggestions, and get help from the wonderful documentarians of Write the Docs. When looking at reviews, you need to answer all issues, requests, and contributors' communications in a timely manner. Reviews should be done as quickly as possible to keep the information fresh and make sure there are no conflicts. If you're using GitHub for a review, there is a way to do an inline review where you can make a suggestion to a particular line of text, and this is truly helpful for your contributors. Be kind and supportive, don't be too critical. And you should never assume your contributor knows everything that you do, especially if they're outside the organization. There might be something that they don't know. There might be information they're not even privy to. And always, always, always thank your contributor for their contribution. Getting people on board the docs train is not exactly easy, but there are several resources that you can use for help. There is a talk that was given by Heather Stetson at Write the Docs Portland 2019 called Any Friend of the Docs is a Friend of Mine, Cultivating a Community of Documentation Advocates. If you haven't seen it, go ahead and take a look. It's a fantastic talk. You can also look at a presentation that I did on building bridges of communication, or you can do any of the following suggestions. Start the docs talk early in the development cycle, before features are developed. Be involved in sprint planning meetings. Be involved in presentations about UI, about UX. 
Make sure that docs is part of feature development and not forgotten. If you're using an agile methodology, docs should be part of the sprint and docs should also be part of the definition of done. Now getting the C-suite executives on board is not easy, but often I find that if you have analytics and numbers, it truly helps. Look at your website, get the Google Analytics and see how many users you have who are unique visitors, what your page views are, what your bounce rate is, or any analytic that you can use to help you, help you support your case. When it comes to ROI, it's pretty simple in that opening your docs will increase involvement with other projects and thus make for a healthier community. Now, obviously this isn't going to work if your company is proprietary and has no open source code, but if they do and they haven't opened their docs yet, then you can um, support it by saying that opening the docs will provide an easier entry to your code and create more contributions and more contributions create, creates a better code base. When it comes to headcount, if the community helps with the docs, you can keep your budget for headcount low and not bust your budget by, and get you help that you need. And if it all else fails and the C-suites are not really on board, then you can run a pilot project. Take one repository, one small group of files, open them to the public and show that this small project can work and then expand it to other projects. Reward. The worst thing that you can do is forget to thank your contributors. When you reward a contributor, keep it meaningful. Mention what they did and how much it helped you. Make it personal. A handwritten note does wonders. Keep it consistent. Don't give one reward to one contributor and a different one to someone else for the same work. Make it global. Don't try to localize the rewards and keep them the same for each region and try to make them unisex. Make your rewards in a step fashion that has tiers to encourage contributors to do more in order to get more rewards. At SillaDB, the people who contribute the most to docs are rewarded as an MVD or a most valuable documenter. The MVD program is a program I started about three years ago in which I look at our contributors after um, a year, at the beginning, at the end of each year. And at our national conference, where we have a SILA summit, um, I give a reward to the top three contributors to SILA Docs. They're given a certificate and a t-shirt that I design that changes from year to year. And so far it has been a really excellent uh, program that many developers uh, truly want to be involved in. So what does our solution look like? Well, first let's look at what we considered. We considered moving to another tool chain, but this was quickly put aside because we knew we needed our developers to be the writers and any tool chain that they didn't know simply wouldn't work. We were committed to using an open source product. So anything that was proprietary also wouldn't work. We couldn't get budget for increasing our headcount, no matter how hard I tried. We did succeed in getting a stellar freelance developer and he's responsible for helping us with a lot of the documentation tools that we're using and for helping us with our Sphinx theme. We considered interns which would have been easy as I had access to so many, but management thought it would take too long to bring anyone up to speed. So we decided to migrate our existing docs from one single closed source repository to reside in the same repository as the code. This meant that each time the code branched, the docs would too. To allow this migration to occur, we had to pull out the CSS or the Sphinx theme from the docs project and maintain it on an external repository. Once the content for each project was migrated, we were able to implement version control for each site. This would allow the users to select the version of the product they wanted to read. 
Our tool chain and workflow work like this. We write our content and restructured text or markdown. APIs are written in Doxygen and Swagger, or actually they are documented in Doxygen and Swagger. We check our spelling and style with a linter called Veil. Vale. We automate our package resolution with poetry. Our CSS or Sphinx theme is distributed on PyPy. We create a sandbox environment with Sphinx. We add additional or custom features also with Sphinx. We host the content on GitHub as GitHub pages. And the site search is provided by Expert Trek. And all issues are tracked within GitHub and a Kanban board called ZenHub, which is a GitHub plugin. A little bit about Sphinx. Sphinx turns markup text in Markdown or restructured text to different formats such as HTML. It accepts both restructured text and Markdown. Restructured text is standardized, fully featured, and used by docs.clidb.com, whereas Markdown is more renowned and more friendly, but less standardized, and is used by many of our upstream projects. The Sphinx theme is a CSS for the docs site, and all projects in Scylla docs use one theme. We have custom extensions and scripts that automate certain processes within the documentation project. And for more information, you can click the link on the slide. We chose this solution in order to make sure that each product's documentation would have a version selector, which matches its version number. The most recent version we marked as stable. Maintainers wanted to help, and that was important. So this solution worked for them, so we decided to go with it. Dividing the content into smaller chunks and putting it onto the project repositories made it easier to maintain. And the biggest plus was that there was minimal change in the user's perspective, which also gave us a very fast turnaround time. So where are we now? The first thing we did was to open a feedback loop to our audience with a feedback button that you can see on the right. Clicking this button goes to a public repository called Scylla Doc Issues. No content is um, published from there, but it allows us to interact with our customers and users so they can actively contribute ideas or um, give us things that we need to correct within our documentation. After we did that, we worked on the Scylla MVD program, which I already explained. This is the reward program that rewards the top three or four contributors on an annual basis to Scylla Docs. Stage three was the driver pilot project where we migrated the docs for the Scylla drivers, which included Python, Java and C++. We also migrated other smaller um, projects such as Scylla Manager, Scylla Monitoring Stack, Scylla Alternator, Scylla Operator, and the Scylla Care Pair example. In stage four, we wrote a style guide, created templates, and created how to contribute to the docs pages. Stage five, we will split enterprise and open source and migrate that content to the repositories and create a documentation docs site for developers. Stage six, we'll implement a new CSS and theme and run some maintenance checks. So what do we still need to do? We still need to formally split Scylla Enterprise open source and cloud and put all that content into the repositories in which they belong. We need to create some type of formal announcement, such as a blog post or an email, and announce our efforts on our blog and website. We need to implement um, the new CSS theme and make sure all our links still work. Once everything is pushed out, we should do some A-B testing and survey our customers and our users and see if they really like these changes. And, and maybe at the end, when all is said and done, we can actually celebrate and 
congratulate ourselves for the good work. So even after all this is done, there's still a few things that we're missing. And if anyone has a solution for them, we are really open to suggestions. One of the biggest gambits, at least in my opinion, is we lack at the, at the moment a component content management system or a CCMS. Having one would allow me as the manager to know in every repository where I have um, the availability for content reuse, where content is being reused, in which repository, in which file. I don't have that at the moment. I would love to have that because it would help me with a lot of potential problems. We don't have tight integration with training and marketing in, the, in that we don't have a content management system. And obviously we need more contributors, not just to Scylla Docs, but the Scylla DB as well. Which brings me to our conclusion. There are several things that you can do. You can become a contributor to Scylla Docs today. Just click the link. We have applied to become a organization for Google Season of Docs. Our application is currently on our wiki page and you can click the link to see that as well. You can contact me at laura at sciladb.com and ask how you can help or if you have any questions. And you can join our Slack channel. The link is there too. I would like to thank you for joining me on this journey. I will happily entertain any questions you have, any comments you have. And I want to thank you for listening. Uh, my name again is Laura Novich. My email is laura at sciladb.com. And thank you again for listening. So yeah, the questions are still flowing in, um, but we'll get started with them. Sure. Um, any suggestions for implementing your own MVD program? Um, how do you choose who gets it? And that comes from Eric. Okay, so um, uh, the caveat I have to say is that our current documentation contributors are our are, are own developers. Um, that was my first challenge, to get them to be involved. So in order to do that, um, GitHub provides uh, metrics that tells me how many contributions each person has made to a particular repository. So it's pretty simple. I just look at the top three contributors who are not myself or my manager. Um, and those three, if, they've, um, if their contributions are active for the past year, are going to be picked. Um, it's just as simple as that. I, I don't try to get anything to really, you know, complicated in looking at uh, who has the best quality of contribution. Um, right now, I'm going for the most contributions because I think the most more activity is definitely better than less. And even if it's poor um, uh, quality than I would like, um, at least for now, getting them involved is the is the first challenge. Right. Um, Sam was wondering about that too, because he is saying like, was it lines of code, qualitative number of PRs? So I think there are a whole bunch of metrics you could yeah. measure it by, but that's- You can measure by anything. You could, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I just kept it simple. Yeah. Um, Sam was also wondering, and I think a lot of people were, um, how do you make docs part of the definition of done? So if that's not the case, how can you maybe push for it? Um, it depends on how close you are with the Scrum Master. Um, that helps. Um, that relationship is key. Um, I was lucky that um, in the companies I've worked for, I've always had a good um, rapport with the, with the people who um, write the features, or sorry, with the people who document the features that I'm writing. So um, I find my way into those um, stand-up meetings. And and this, you know, it starts out as an innocent question at first. You know, you just simply ask, shouldn't this be documented? And most of the time they'll say yes. Um, then you proceed one step further and you say, okay, can we add this as part of the definition of done? And if you 
constantly repeating that same message. Eventually, it gets into their head that it's easier for them to just add it, and therefore you shut up, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and um, you know, continue that way. Um, and eventually, they see the value in it. Um, that you know, having it defined from the from the get go, everyone knows that you know it's not done until it's documented. Yeah, I think that'll give people a lot of hope. Um, we've got some proof that it actually can happen. <laughs> um, Rachel has a question. With increased writer headcount, would you still have considered opening up the docs, which I think is a really great question. Yeah. And yeah. sort of as a follow-up, Jen asked how many writers would really support this program? Okay, so I am a solo writer. And Definitely. we have a, a very high... Um, writer to developer ratio i think we're we're averaging about 60 to 1 i think was my last time i counted so um yeah it's it's tough and would i have open sourced the docs if i had more help uh yes um simply because um we are an open source uh organization and i think our documentation has to follow so I was very passionate about opening the docs from the first day I joined. That was three years ago. It took a while to get everybody else to agree that this was the way to go. Um, luckily, I'm in this journey now. We're not done. Um, we're about halfway there. But I felt that I had learned enough at this point to be able to share with everybody um, the pitfalls that we had experienced. Right. And I think a lot of what you shared um, isn't even really um, specific to open source. It's just good project management, right? And so I think it's always good to yeah. really talk about what those concepts are and how to make them work with each other. So I thought that was really cool. Um, Heather had a question. What about licensing and contributor agreements? Um, so right now, um, we are licensed um, through, I think it's MIT. Um, I currently don't have um, a contributor agreement that everyone signs when they um, contribute to the docs uh, simply because at the moment <laughs> we're not truly 100% open yet. And it isn't something I have um, publicized really yet. Um, in going forward, um, I, I realized that that was probably a mistake on my part. And I will definitely be formulating a contributor's agreement uh, in order to get started. Good to know. Rachel has a really interesting question. Another interesting question. She's on fire this morning. <laughs> Did any of your concerns turn out to be founded? For example, docs quality or managing a lot of submissions? Um, it's still too early, unfortunately, to tell. Um, I'm still in the middle of the muck, so to speak. And um, I have to get on the other side of it in order to honestly be able to evaluate whether or not this was all really worth it. Um, my own um, fear aside, <clears throat> when I started this whole process, was um, you know that I, it, all this would be for nothing. And in lo looking at what we've done so far and where we want to go, um, that part of me has actually um, come to the conclusion that it's not going to be as bad as I think. Um, what is going to help is going to get more contributors to the actual code base. And that is something that we as an organization are going to have to figure out. Um, once we get that going, I think docs will just naturally follow. Yeah, makes sense. Um, we've got probably more questions than we can cover in the time that we have, but I'm seeing some questions come up about I, people I think are, um, are curious about your about your Git setup. And so yeah. Tommy was wondering, why create a separate repo for issues in addition to the main docs repo? OK, so it, initially, what we had is we had one pro closed private repository, and we weren't opening it. So when we implemented a feedback button, we needed a way to create issues that was public. So the workaround was that we created a public repository for our doc issues. Um, none of the development or code work or anything goes on there. It's simply used as a, lack of a better word, a garbage bin,
to collect all of the um, issues that customers or readers or whoever um, open. And then in the regular um, repository, everything was addressed. So it allowed our readers who were filing issues um, ability for me to communicate with them, to collect more information from them, to understand what's happening, and then to tell them, hey, you know, thank you for, for your for your for your um, inquiry or your or for your feedback. Um, here's um, your issue has been fixed or is in is in process or whatever the case may be. Is, is this this particular repo allowed me to? Um, communicate with all of our readers, which is something we didn't have before. Um, will this repository still remain once we're open? I'm not sure, probably not. Right, interesting. Um, and then some questions about what happens after that. So Alexandra is wondering, do you have someone dedicated to moderating and vetting the contributions or is this a shared task among the team? And do you accept a lot of contributions? <laughs> okay. so the team is currently just me. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, um, it, it's becoming pretty um, difficult now that we've done this whole massive migration process. So I'm no longer looking at just one repository. I'm looking at 12. Um, so we are going to eventually, well, we already have, we're gonna hit critical mass and I'm going to need more help. And eventually um, those above me will understand that increasing my uh, headcount is important and we'll get there. Um, but right now what, what we have is we have a two-step review process. So um, I review all um, pull requests that come in um, sometimes my manager does that as well. He's the product manager, Tzach. Um, and then we also have um, a review done by another developer who didn't write the docs. And possibly somebody from the solutions team also takes a look. Um, QA sometimes comes in and tests the solution, making sure that it works according to how it was written. So essentially there, there are enough people looking at any particular issue. So I know that once all everyone says it looks good to me that, um, that it's ready to be merged. Um, almost every contribution that is, that is given to me, I test. So I make sure that it actually works opposite the system. The one thing I may not have mentioned is that um, I always run my doc tests on a green system, meaning um, something that's a fresh install because developers tend to have their own setup that may include something that customers may not have. And for me, it's important that we test our, um, all of our procedures on a system that looks exactly like the way the customer gets it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Laura. Unfortunately, we're out of time and we've got some questions left. So I hope that people will reach out to you. Um, there was a question about your slides deck being available. I've seen you're already on the ball. You've already posted it. And I hope that's just fine yeah, for more um, discussion just, in the future. Yeah, you know, but basically look me up on uh, LinkedIn. All of my slides are um, there. Um, I will be updating my LinkedIn profile um, in a matter of minutes with, with this new slide deck, I, I didn't realize that in between the time that I created this talk and the talk that I gave in February um, locally in Israel, my slide deck uh, differed slightly. So I'll upload a, a new slide deck and have that ready for you um, to use. And uh, like I said, uh, contact me on Slack on LinkedIn, uh, any way you want. Um, I usually don't go to Twitter. So if you're looking for me there, you're wasting your time. But um, <laughs> any other uh, platform is perfectly fine. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing all these ideas with us. What a great way to start the day.